Welcome to episode 24 of the About to Break podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and I want to do a special shout out to my buddy, Sean Hale, one of my oldest and dearest friends who set up the interview this week with Tobin, who you're going to hear from in just a little bit. Sean's such a rad dude, and this episode definitely wouldn't have been possible without him connecting me with Tobin in the band. So thanks so much, man. I don't have much to plug this week other than our Jokers and Aces show, which I'm so excited about. It's going to be in the Nerdist showroom at Meltdown Comics on Sunday, June 4th at 7 p.m. And the lineup for this show is incredible, folks. We're going to have comedians and magicians performing together in the best comedy venue in LA. That's right. I'm talking magicians Justin Wilman, David Kovac, Matt Marcy, Myself and Eddie Firth are going to be hosting, and we have some incredible comedians as well. Matt McCarthy, folks, Scout Durwood, and Byron Bowers. This is a dream lineup, and I'm so stinking excited about it. If you're interested in attending that show, tickets are going fast. You can get the tickets right now at the Meltdown Comics website, and you can just click the link that's on the show notes right here. Go reserve your tickets. We will see you Sunday, June 4th at the Jokers and Aces show. That's all I got for today. I know you're going to enjoy this episode. We go deep, folks. We go real deep. Some topics and some issues that honestly are a little hard for me to talk about. Uh, but I think are really important, and it's always great to hear someone's story and their perspective, and this episode is chock full of that. Enjoy it, guys. In episode 24, I sit down with Tobin Bawinkle, the lead singer of my favorite Celtic punk band, Flatfoot56. Guys, this conversation is so good. Tobin is definitely one of my tallest guests so far. Uh, measures 6'10", and his heart's as big as his height. We talk about everything on this episode, from living life on the road, to trying to figure out life, and life after death, and faith, and all sorts of stuff. And uh, this episode, honestly, guys, we talk about some things that are a little touchy for me as I'm in process, but I'm so grateful to Tobin. Such a generous dude and a guy that truly loves people. I know you're going to enjoy him. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy my conversation with Tobin of the band Flatfoot56. Hey, everybody, you're listening to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and I'm here with Tobin of the band Flatfoot56. Welcome, man. Thanks, man, for having me. This is awesome. Thanks for doing this. We are in some sort of garage turned... Uh, studio apartment, Studio looks apartment. Like. <laughs> so I've been a fan of your music, and my buddy who turned me on to you guys, we grew up in bands together. He was a bass player. I was a guitar player. So we always, every time we get together, the conversation turns to music. <laughs> and a few months back, he's like, man, you got to get into to Flatfoot. And so I started listening to your new al- album, Odd Boat, just awesome. loving it. Binge the whole thing. And uh, then he told me, he's like, dude, the, ba- the band's coming through, they're touring, and they're going to be, you know, we're doing a barbecue and stuff. He's like, if you want to come do a podcast, I said, yes, That's I awesome. do. Yeah, so man. <laughs> so we're perfect. here, we're in the, the weird studio, the, the rest of the guys are spread out. We got WrestleMania on the TV. <laughs> for some, some we, we don't watch a lot of wrestling, but for some reason, this tour, we've had two different binge nights of either WrestleMania or, or vintage wrestling. I'm a fan of more of the early 80s wrestling stuff. Yeah, it's changed a stuff. lot, yeah. man. It, how much has Sean had to do with the wrestle? Not I, much, okay. actually. No, we, I think the beginning of this tour, our drummer, he likes wrestling, so I think um, he's probably a part. I think just showing up to friends' houses and, stay, and, and hanging out and... They're watching it. We walk in. We're like, "Oh, this will be fun. Let's do yeah. this." You know. So yeah, the, the modern stuff is really cheesy, but the old school stuff is <laughs> like they actually wrestled back then. They I did. Think, I think more of this is just acting. Yeah, with, with I rem- muscles. <laughs> I remember, man. I grew up with like uh, Jake the Snake. Oh, okay, gotcha. Dude. Yeah, and I remember when Jake the Snake, Andre the Giant, said yeah. Jake the Snake, Snake. I cried, oh. dude. I was like a little kid. I was like, no. <laughs> don't do it don't kill the snake so you guys this is like kind of the one of the one of the few nights off that you've got on this tour right i mean you got to um, be in san diego tomorrow night yeah we'll be in san diego tomorrow night we've actually had a few days off on this tour um but anytime you head west we're from chicago so yeah uh, anytime you head west there's always a lot of 
big long drives, especially when you take the northern route. So we started um, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, then went to Billings, Montana, and then started up in Seattle and then headed down the coast. So tomorrow is our last California show in San Diego. Yeah. And then we start heading back east after that, doing touring to uh, Arizona, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, and and Nebraska. So how does it change up when you're on the road versus when you're doing shows like in town? What's the, <laughs> what's the dynamic difference that you're dealing with there? When you're on the road, you kind of have you get in the groove and you kind of keep going. Yeah. Uh, the unity in the guys tends to be tighter when you're not just doing weekend shows, but yeah. um, but with that comes the days that are rough, you know. So you're not um, at peak joy the whole time through, <laughs> through, through tour. Sometimes you go through a day if you're having a rough day, you just kind of work out, and yeah. everyone else is kind of like, oh, he's having a day, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So and it's cool when you when you've got people that you're working with who are our understanding of that yeah because it does i know for me even like you know traveling full-time and people are like oh that's so cool it like is there's kind of like this exotic thing about travel when you don't do it and then when you do do it you're like it's really not as great <laughs> i, wa- I want to be at home <laughs> yeah i think um we we changed our, tr- our tours our tour approach up the last few years we used to tour 280 shows a year yeah we were all over the world, just traveling constantly. We did that for, from about 2006 to 2012, so six years, just constant touring. We just said we decided, you know, we want to work smarter and not harder. Yeah. Um, we want to, we just want to be smart. Our families need us to be around and available. Um, a lot of us were getting married and stuff like that, so it was kind of like our wives can't have us gone all the time. So we have yeah. to figure out how a way to make this work and. Um, not everybody can travel with the band, uh, so right. not because we don't allow it, because their jobs don't allow it or whatever. Yeah. So, but yeah, we uh, made it happen, and we're trying to figure that that new equilibrium out and figure out how that looks. So, because when you guys first started, was it was most everybody was single in the band, or yeah, yeah, when we started, uh, I was seventeen years old. And my brother, my brother Kyle, was our bass player. He was twelve, so. That kid was playing bars when he was 13, 14 years old. Wow. And he's pretty much grown up in bars playing shows. So, like, um, our, my other brother, Justin, who used to play drums for us until about 2013, uh, you know, he was, I think he was 16 when we started, 15 or 16. So, yeah. Um, yeah it kind of hones every aspect of your life when you start that young. And it's the same band, yeah. too. It's not other other bands. And then we started Flatfoot. It's Flatfoot since we were 17. So. And the music has been the same throughout? Or, I mean, I'm sure it's evolved. <coughs> Yeah, we've gotten better. I think uh, if you, we don't. We have two records that were out before 2005 that we don't let anybody hear. The real, the real hardcore fans will find a way to illegally to download it or whatever. Yeah. And every once in a while, if there's a good cause, I think like a few years ago, we had a buddy, um, a buddy's tattoo shop get burglarized and destroyed, and uh, we uh, so we did a benefit for him and we we sold some of the old records and they they sold like. We put it up for bidding, and people paid some really expensive prices for yeah. those early albums. So, but it's just for like you know if things get tight or if there's a good cause involved. But, That's great. Um, but yeah, those early ones are just us trying to figure out who we were as a band, and I think I think we really arrived at what we wanted to do around 2005. Yeah, um, 2004. What first drew you to music? Because you and your brother both played when you were young. What, who, yeah. was, who was the first to pick up an instrument? Um, I was actually. We grew up in a family that played bluegrass, so oh, that's right. my parents would get together. I remember I have pictures of me waddling around as a, as a, uh, a little kid. And, uh, my parents used to run a group called, I think they were called God's Little Lights, and they would go to nursing homes, and it was a group of kids. And my parents would lead, and they would all sing songs for elderly people. And I, my older sister was involved with that group, and they would just it was just a way to reach out and bless older people that yeah. weren't around little kids very much. So. I remember being around a lot of those environments, and then my parents were always singing old country bluegrass type songs um, for family jam sessions in our living room. Yeah. So I originally played percussion, and then bass was the okay. first thing I played, and then I picked up guitar in 2012. That's awesome. And um, cool. Who's, who, who is that jamming right now? Uh, the guy jamming is actually Brandon, our mandolin player. He's he's uh, trying out some of uh, Sean's gear Sean's over in the toys. house there. So if you hear that over this podcast, it's actually Probably about twenty yards away. Um, that's how loud. <laughs> that's how deaf he is. Um, that's great, but, man. Uh, it happens after playing small clubs with loudspeakers. Oh yeah, when you first. Yeah. <laughs> and we like it loud too. So. Oh man, I was just um, I was in Seattle with a buddy of mine, uh, who folks who have listened to the podcast have heard him, Zach Yandera. Um, but we were just we went to a show, 
small little club in Seattle, and yeah. it was just like, dude, this. What, what club was it? Uh, it was called. Hold on. It's the Fun House. Yes, it was the Fun House. Yeah, we just played there the other night. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I was there like a <clears throat> week and a half ago. Yeah, yeah, we were there um, on Tuesday night. What did you think about it, man? It was great. It was awesome. There's a big metal head, metal show. We walked in. A uh, huge metal show happening in the big Alcor Zone room. And we walked mm-hmm. in, and the sound guy, first thing he yeah. said was, they took all my inputs. You guys have, like, six lines to work with no on this way. stage. Uh, they were running, like, 47 inputts on, on their <laughs> stage. And so they, they stole all my, wire, my cords, my cables, and we're like, honestly, don't mic anything except for the kick and our vocals. We'll work it yeah. out. And uh, it worked out good. We, we packed the room, and it was fun. That's so, great, man. Yeah. Yeah, we were there. We saw uh, the Spits were playing. Oh, the Spits are great. Dude, yeah, they were dude. great, man. That's great stuff. Such a good show. Yeah, dude. That's so funny that you guys were just like, Oh, yeah, yeah. That's like one of the classic stops, you know. Seattle is one of those towns that just has a lot of different venues, but you never know which one is hitting at the right time. Right. So you got to make sure you hit the right spot that people are aware of. That's, so. that's a weird thing, too, man, is figuring out the business side of this whole thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And when I say business, I mean, like like you said, where the audience is going and where do people want to hang. And Yeah. That's a, that's a, it's a hard one, too. We kind of came off of a... When, before putting this record out, we kind of came off of a season of just not playing as much and not being totally ingrained. There were some people that thought we had broken up, and we, we were playing about 25 to... Between 25 and 50 shows a year. Yeah. But it just... People just... Their attention span is so short now. It used to be I'm a fan for life, right? And now it's like, oh, I haven't seen you in 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 a month. I'm I thought you broke up. You know, it's like no, um, we're just trying to make sure that we can last longer than a flash in the pan. You know? Oh man, so. well, accessibility of mu- music and entertainment is just yeah. it's changing the whole landscape. I mean, it's great, it, but it's also it's also really difficult as well because you not only do you play music anymore and just tour, you have to be social media um, whiz you have to be up on all the latest ways that music's getting out there um, you almost have to have a hipster in your band in order to know what's going on <laughs> yeah. it's like and that which is like and as you get older I mean I'm 34 now like I feel bad but sometimes I'm just like I, I, when I get home I don't want to go out right. as much as I used to and I yeah. should and go see friends you know what I mean like go go be in the scene but Chicago has a show every night yeah um, and it's just like I could I could I would never I have to work a full time job when I go home too. So like, yeah. it's a full time job. This is a full time job. I'm in another band called Six Ten, yeah. which is like a folk Americana Celtic project that I'm in, and that's a, that could be a full time job. And then this is like all encompassing. So, right. um, and we, we do a lot of our stuff DIY too. We don't. We we've been on labels over the years, but this last album was put out uh, pretty much through Pledge Music campaign uh, pre sale uh, orders. Yeah. And um, some help with distribution from a label called uh, uh, Sailor's Grave Records out of Philadelphia that is awesome, and they're they're putting it out into all the stores. But um, they're just partnering with us. We're not we're not signed to them or anything. Okay. So it's kind of like a it's just an interesting it's an interesting journey. How it's does how does that compare to in the past with working through labels? We also live right by the airport. Just so oh, y'all yeah. know. <laughs> so it's, it's like home. I live right next to Midway Airport, so oh yeah, planes flying it's over great. my house. It's yeah. great, man. I land and I call my I call my wife. I'm like, honey, I just got here. Yeah. And by the time she gets there, my bags are coming out. So are you in the backyard sunbathing right yeah, now? Yeah. I just saw you from my window. <laughs> I think you, I can yeah. see my house. Yeah. Whoa. Um, whoa. <laughs> um, you were talking about this time doing more of like the DIY thing with producing your own stuff and yeah. like how do you did you enjoy that journey more than working with a label or what are for folks who are kind of considering doing their own thing yeah what are the ups and downs of going that route um the ups let's go over the ups the ups are that you get to own everything yeah you get to make be the one that decides where your money gets spent and where it doesn't um you get to you, you're more passionate about your music than any label will ever be yeah um they're trained to know how to talk to you to make you believe that they are completely ecstatic about you um and they're and and they're legitimate labels that do love bands. You know, right. there's nothing wrong with a label. They're they're great at what they do, um, but we've also experienced it where they just they tell you what you, they think you want to hear, so they can get you to do what they want you to do. And then um, when it doesn't look like the way they want it to look, they kind of just back out. And yeah. when they back out, you're stuck with them owning 20, you know fifty percent of your publishing. 
uh, forever, you know, and you're just right. like, whoa, oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and how does this work? It depends on the deal that you worked, but, and then you also, you know, you, you have things that just don't get done the way that you want them to. I mean, we, we had some scenarios where we were told we'd have distribution in Europe, which is a huge market for us. And right. we got over there and one store had it in there and we're like, uh, you, and we couldn't sell it ourselves because we didn't have, you weren't allowed we have, to sell your own merch? Well, we could sell our merch uh, at the show, and that was fine. Right. But we couldn't distribute it ourselves because there was a deal for that album oh. through a company that didn't distribute it. So um, it's just stuff like that, you know. Uh, we've been, we've had some, we've had some labels that just, you know, did a great job too. Like there were some labels. I, I guess the point I'm making is the, in the, the world that we live in right now, it's easier to release yourself yeah. if you're willing to work for it. There's been some labels that I loved working with. Yeah, it is helpful um, when you're on a label because they're trying to get tours for you. They're trying to help it out. If there's other bigger bands on the label, they'll they'll match you up with that. You'll go support them. Um, yeah, like we were we've been on some tours with some great bands because of labels, and that's that's always awesome. But we have a built-in fan base as Flatfoot. All these years, we have people that are that are lifers with us, and yeah. they're raising their kids on us now. You know, I it's just kind of crazy. Man. That's kind of um, we know that they're with us. We're not. We know that they're gonna stick with us, and that they're passionate about the band. They believe in what we talk about. They believe in the music, and uh, they can identify with it. And when you have people like that, um, who are your core following and your core backing, you're just like, man, I just want to make sure that we do right by them and give them a lot of cool things. Like yeah. let's let's create some special edition stuff. Let's create something that's special for them if they really want it and. Um, let's let's boutique this. Let's not make this mass like as mass production oriented, but more uh, boutique it and create some special edition stuff. That's cool, man. When you were when you were first getting into music and you were younger, was there bands that you noticed did stuff like that? And you were like, did that drive you to want to do it? Or there was a few bands that we learned from. A lot of things changed from like 2008 mm. till now. Like this has been a warp speed change since then. So. Um, but yeah, there were bands that we that we watched. Uh, we we had a very long learning experience. <laughs> we we started from absolutely knowing nothing, not knowing any bands. Uh, really didn't have any bands that took us under our wing for the first four or five years of the band. Okay. And then as we went, we'd get little opportunities. You know, I think the biggest break for us was uh, we were on a pub tour with two bands from one one band from here called Angel City Outcast. Yeah, it was a bar tour. They were an awesome band. And another band from Texas called Born to Lose. We were doing this uh, bar tours, 20 people a night, 30 people a night, um, just going to these bars all around the coast of the eastern seaboard. And we got a call from our label in Japan. Um, they were like, hey, uh, Gogo Bordillo had to cancel uh, a tour with Flog and Molly, and they have an opening need. <laughs> no Can way. you guys be here in a week and tour with Flog and Molly for a week in Japan? And we're like, we're this little punk band. Yeah. Um, we had played with Flogging once before I opened up for them in Chicago. And we're like, yeah, we'll do it. We had to rush pa all of our passports. This is back in 2006. Rush all our passports. Yeah, yeah. We'd never been out of the country as a band. Wow. And we flew to Japan within a week. Um, all the bands we were on tour with, they were like, if you don't take this opportunity, you know, go. You need How to cool go. that they would like push you to do it and not like, yeah. hold you to the dates and all that. I yeah, mean, some of the best. I mean, and we were just going into the area where we had the biggest pull. Uh, okay. For that tour, which yeah. they, they sacrificed a lot for us, but they were like, This is an opportunity you can't pass up. And so we went and did it, and it was one of the best memories I have of playing this band to be with Flaga Molly for a week um, in, in, in Tokyo and, wow. you know, Nag uh, Nagoya, and just, just being in places that I had never dreamed I'd ever be. Um, and so that. With, with a band that you respect musically? Yeah, like, I, I've, always, yeah. I've always respected Vlogging a lot. They're really. Uh, just just the fact that they. Like, just if you ever get a chance to be backstage when they're about ready to hit the stage, they gather together, they huddle together, they hug and kiss each other, and they thank each other for playing music with them and giving up their, their family life and their time to be out Jeez. making the, each other's dreams possible. That's beautiful. And, and it's, a, it's one of the coolest rituals I've ever seen a band that do. That is so cool. Yeah, so I, I highly. Highly respect that band, yeah. uh, and they're really good business people, and they know what they're doing. So, your brother at the time that you guys started, you were seventeen, he was twelve. Seventeen, twelve, and then thirteen, uh, fourteen. Fourteen okay. um, was my other brother. We started it as a three piece. So. What pulled you from country bluegrass roots to Celtic punk? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, my sister uh, came home. My sister was kind of the. 
for lack of a better term, the the black sheep, the rebel mm-hmm. of the family. She was the oldest. Yeah. She was the one that was willing to take risks. And uh, she was out of the house by this time. Um, and when she'd come and visit us in Chicago, um, she would come and like kind of sneak me uh, records, like ska albums, punk records. I got into ska really like in the nineties, you oh, know, the yeah, third wave dude. ska thing. Oh. And um, so my first my first introduction to that music was her kind of just being like, "You check this band out, check these guys out," and uh, that's where I, my love for music started was with her. And then we just kind of it just kind of spiraled into this. Um, it just got deeper and deeper, and I was like, "I gotta play music. I gotta play music. I want to be in a punk band. I want to play music." So were you already playing an instrument at this? this point or no yeah yeah my dad's a pastor so we were playing in church and stuff acoustic uh, acoustic stuff and um, that's like the smartest pastor move is to raise your kids on instruments so you yeah. always have a band <laughs> <laughs> it's true and uh, a lot of times like i mean you'll, you'll notice this with a lot of like gospel churches at the south side of chicago or whatever um they raise up kids to where like one kid will be sitting next to the drummer mm. as he's playing and he's watching this guy play and then as 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 the months go on, the weeks go on, he'll slowly pass and he'll move out of the way and this kid who's ten, nine years old yeah. will will move into the drummer's seat and he'll keep playing. The same thing with the organ, guitar. And they just they, they raise up a culture of musicians. Yep. Um and, and it's kind of a really beautiful process and this is basically what my folks did too. I don't think they were too excited at first about the punk rock thing, but yeah. um they came along eventually and uh it worked out. So I guess Yeah, it's wild, man. You you see that a lot. I mean, I grew up, that's where I learned how to play guitar was in church. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of great, great musicians first started because, you know, growing up in church and someone said, we need someone who can play guitar. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. need someone who can play keys. Totally. You know, they just throw them in there. Totally. It's a, it's a beautiful environment. It's funny. Like when schools, when schools are cutting music programs, right and left, mm. uh, sometimes the only place for a kid to learn an instrument is in church, you know? And so, um, that was kind of the that was the my story at least and yeah my parents would always sing really weird blue like folk <laughs> songs to us as kids too so it was kind of that weird like they, they, I sing some of them now and I'm like what were they thinking like super this is weird a, syncopation yeah, like <laughs> well just like just the content was just like <laughs> I need an example who was, who was on drugs with this I need an example <laughs> there was a song um, they had a song about all the like there was a, there was an old song they used to play about. This barnyard dance when all of the vegetables and fruit would come alive and they would all dance together. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's called. It was called the. Um, I think I, the line was uh, late one night in the pale moonlight. All the vegetables had a spree. Oh man, like the, the it talks about all the different kinds of vegetables that came alive and then they would dance around. It was like straight out of like sausage party. It was like what yeah. in the world is going on here? And it was like talking about like old uh, old man, you know, garlic, uh, you know. What? Like old man garlic and like all these different characters and <laughs> then they had songs that were just like these weird rhymes. Um there's a song that was like the horses run around, their feet are on the ground, who who will wind the clock while I'm away? Uh the snake's belt slips because he has no hips. What? Like just really weird weird it's songs kinda, that have sounds weird kind of like, like Irish bar tunes. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the reason we got into the what we got into, because we were used to this really Almost like I think some of these songs were written while people were just yeah. drunk. Like they just didn't. They just put lyrics together and were just like going crazy with it. And if you look at traditional Irish music, there's some songs in there that tell stories. Like Willa Willa Woya is like all yeah. about a murdering old woman who kills little children. So like, and you're just like, what? This is a messed up song. Yeah, like there's a line in that song. That and says, everyone's just raising a glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Willa Willa Woya. Yeah. There's a line that's like. She took a baby, six months old, Wheeler Wheeler Warrior, and smashed his head upon the rocks. Like and he was like, "What is going on? Like this oh is awful." Goodness. But it's 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 a it's a documentation of a people's history. Yeah. It's a people a people's life. It's it's documenting the hard trials of what it's like to live where I live. Mm. And I think that's the thing that drew us to it because we're we're from blue the south side of Chicago, uh, very blue collar yep. uh, style place. Um, your dream job as a South Side kid is is a is a city job. You know, okay. you want to be yeah, a, you yeah, want to yeah. be a garbage you want to garbage be collector because you, you make you make a fortune if you're right. a union worker, and, yep. um, and that's the best you can ever hope for. Forget being a doctor or a lawyer; and that's so, out of your yeah. reach, or anything yeah. with the arts. Yeah, exactly, yeah, cause, exactly. Because there, I mean, our local high school had a uh, had a marching band that they slowly disintegrated, and now they're just teaching guitar oh, wow. and piano. 
and then do choir. But that's pretty much it. Yeah. Like, there's not much. Um, and and the, the guitar teacher doesn't play guitar. <laughs> so, Are you serious? Yeah, Did you just yeah. show YouTube videos? <laughs> uh, it's, 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 yeah. yeah so, so. so growing up in an environment where there wasn't a lot of opportunity with that, and mm-hmm. then hearing these songs that, there's something beautiful about using using song to tell stories. Absolutely. You know, and I know you've you've alluded to the lyrics that you guys put together. Like I mm-hmm. love that you'll take even even like your first track on this <laughs> album is Ty Cobb. Yeah. Who who's the big uh, Ty Cobb fan that Well, I I I wrote all the songs except for a, a song called Forward which Brandon our man yeah. played, which is a phenomenal That's a great song. song. Yeah. And he wrote that at a really pivotal time in his life. Um, and then there was another song called KPM, which is about our bagpiper's dad who passed away a few years mm. ago. So he and I worked on that one. But um, I'm a huge history guy, so I was watching yeah. I was watching Ken Burns' baseball documentary, and I remember getting really intrigued is by this. Is this Ken Burns? Who d- Wait. Ken Burns, yeah, Ken Burns. He does uh, like a history. The, Civ- the Civil War. It's yeah, all history yeah, yeah, documentaries, yeah. yeah. He told a little bit about um, Ty Cobb and his story and who he was. And I remember one line from that song that always stuck with me. It was a sports writer wrote about Ty Cobb. He said, uh, Ty Cobb is such an angry person that he would climb a mountain just to slap an echo. And and wow. um, and I, I was like, that's such a, the word picture in that. It's just like he would climb an entire mountain just to get back at an echo that was coming back at him. Like he just had this anger issue. Um, and part of it was because, you know, I think part of it was because the, the week before he shipped out for the major leagues, uh, from his his home in in Georgia, his dad was climbing through the window of his of his of his house, yeah, um, because he had locked himself out, and his mom blew him away right in front of him with a shotgun. So killed his dad right in front of him, uh, and then he goes off to the Detroit Tigers, where they mercilessly uh, just give him a really hard time. He becomes a really angry, bitter dude, but also one of the greatest baseball players the game's ever known. So. I, I'm a yeah. I'm a baseball fan, but I'm not like a total yeah, sports yeah, yeah, junkie. Yeah. But I just remember, I like when I hear a story of somebody that is completely just doing just just they do things in their own way, and nobody else tells them how to do it. Yeah, I really get intrigued with that. So and there's it's, a lot of stuff with him. Like it he, keeps going. Like he used he, to sharpen his cleats, right? Yeah, he, he used to sharpen his cleats so that he could he could dive. Dive in with his with his cleats up to stick the second baseman or the or the catcher that he was diving into. He used to refer to uh, baseball not being a gentleman's pastime, but it's a war. Um, and he's and the and the the hitters are the are the bombs. Um, wow. You know, like uh, there's a there's a famous story. He was coaching uh, the Detroit Tigers one time. He was playing left field, and the, and Babe Ruth is up at the plate, and he. Uh, he he um he yells from the field he says to his pitcher he's like he's like um <clears throat> he's like remember what we talked about we always walk the babe right you know and they yeah, were friends yeah, yeah, he's yeah. friends with babe ruth actually and the pitcher actually throws a strike and he starts screaming and swearing at him from right field uh from the field and it's like you, i told you we were supposed to do this <laughs> and uh and he's like remember we walk him and so the babe's just sitting there going okay and Pitcher throws another strike, two strikes now, and, and and Ty Cobb loses it, and he he runs in and just starts screaming at his pitcher. He's like, "You don't understand what you're messing with," and does this big or, big big old this ordeal during the game. During the game, just just totally demeaning this guy. He walks back out to the field, and the pitcher throws a third strike and strikes out Babe Ruth. The entire thing was a setup that they had talked to or talked about prior to the game, really? and he actually said, "I'm gonna go nuts because you're pitching strikes to the man just to throw him off the game." And I want you to strike him out because we're going to be doing this huge ordeal. And like the whole thing was to get Babe Ruth thinking he was going to be walked because that's what happened normally. And so like, it, he he was just he was a conniving, crazy, um, crazy dude. He jumped. He he jumped. There's a story. He jumped into the bleachers one time because somebody called him a racial slur. He jumped into the bleachers and started beating a fan to death. Beating a fan like crazy. People were like, "Hey, this dude's in a wheelchair." And and Ty Cobb's response is, "He's still." A blankety blank. Wow. I don't care. You know, so you just had an anger issue. <laughs> it's great. Well, you know, and, and he's still in the world, Hall of Fame. He's still there. Well, you know? you know what? I think so many of the heroes that we look back on would would be considered like anything politically but. incorrect. Well, completely. Yeah. Well, if people had camera phones, yeah. oh <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? yeah, never would have survived. Even even um, 
I mean, I've <coughs> being a magician, I'm mm. fascinated by Houdini. Oh yeah. And the thing that fascinates me about him is all reports of him were that he wasn't a great performer. Hmm. I mean, he wasn't the best at magic. Yeah. You know, there his <coughs> his claim to fame was he would just uh make audacious claims and then do them realizing that like even if it doesn't go off well you know 300 people are going to see me in the show but the whole world's going to hear that i did this yeah yeah like they were, he's got guts oh know. dude a reporter came up to him once and he didn't even know this was happening and the reporter goes what do you think about the magician thurston's gonna make a horse disappear on friday mm -hmm. and he goes that's ridiculous i want to make an elephant disappear on thursday <laughs> Without knowing where am I going to get an elephant? How am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that isn't that how isn't that how entertainment is? Like, it's it's all about the extravagance, the um, the audacity. These days, it's all about the shock. Yeah, and um, that's hard. That's hard as a musician because you yeah. you want it to be about the art, and yet there's so much mat. There's so much art out there that people get lost to that, and. and and they don't uh, they don't stick on a band long enough to learn what that band's talking about right. or what it's all about for them. And, so, and, it, and it's no longer just about the music or mm -hmm. the movies or yeah. the you know the art that you're creating. It's totally. about this persona. It's about the drama. I was going back to wrestling. We were talking about that in the beginning. Like I'm watching current wrestling, WrestleMania 2017, and there's more soap opera crap on that stage than there is actual <laughs> wrestling. And you're like. This is horrible wrestling. You go back and watch the original guys. It was oh, about yeah. the art of wrestling. It was about, it was about like the conflict of two massive individuals just, yeah. just going at it. And even though it was still fake, it was just kind of like one of those things. Like these dudes, they were way more believable about it. You know, yeah, they had oh, something yeah. to prove. You know, yeah, it wasn't just a big pageant. You know, Thing sorry, wrestling fans, if you're a wrestling <laughs> fan, forgive me. I know I'm probably crapping on a lot of people's you know no. icons, but if you haven't figured out it's fake yet. Uh, <laughs> We should have another talk, you know. There's some there's some thirty four year old in Silver Lake yeah. going, What? What? <laughs> no. no. I knew Santa wasn't real, but wrestling, you gotta be kidding me. This tour you were mentioning that it's been the one of the toughest, like logistical things. The worst the worst thing you can hear, we have a we have a Freightliner Sprinter van. A great vehicle on gas, awesome for touring, foreign made. Yeah. Um, so all of it's in metric and it's very, not a lot of people know. It's also diesel. So not every mechanic can work on it. Um, so when you're out on the road with this thing and it breaks down, uh, it's a nightmare. You yeah. can use very, very few cities have a diesel, a diesel sprinter van mechanic. And um, very rarely do you break down in like a major metropolitan, you know, like <laughs> yeah, right. you're never not in a metropolis. You're supposed to. Oh, yeah. We've been really fortunate though. We've never, as a band, we've never had a van being stolen, been stolen, never oh, had gear good, stolen man. other than at our practice space when we were home, we had it busted into and stolen from there. But that's another story. Um, a fun one, but another. And uh, I like fun stories. I, I can tell it to you if you want, but um, <laughs> we, so we've been really fortunate and uh, this tour, for some reason, is the worst <laughs> vehicle scenario I've ever been in yeah. in this band. Uh, we broke down an hour and a half outside of Oregon. We had a towed to Oregon, and we had to start our tour with Larry and his flask. And um, found out, um, I, I, my wife was with us on tour. I left her in Oregon <laughs> to bring the van once it was done, because we thought it was going to be about a day. She yeah. could join us in the next city. She was down with that. She's like, I'll chill out in Oregon. I get to see Portland, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, they call us up and say, hey, your transmission's blown. It's full of, we open up the pan and it's full of it's full of uh, metal. And uh, you just completely, your transmission's shot. For a Sprinter, for a normal van, that's a, that's a big price tag. For yeah. a Sprinter, it's about eight grand to, oh, to replace man. one of those. So like, uh, you're just like, you're like There what? goes all of our... That, that's the tour, that's you know, tour. that's pretty much it. So we... Um, we debated. We were like, should we just sell our vehicle and try to figure out a way to finish the tour with a rental? And uh, thankfully, Portland is the only city that I know two different guys that rent vans out and do tour management um, with them. Really? And uh, so I called up a buddy, and he was just like, you know what, man? I work till 3 o'clock tonight, uh, but I can at, right after work, I can get out, go get it, get it all ready for you and have it to you free tomorrow morning to take. And he completely came through and just... 
uh, blessed us immensely and got us a van to rent to borrow for this. So anyway, for the last week, my wife has been stuck in Portland, um, <laughs> staying with people she doesn't even know some nights, um, meeting people she's never met before, uh, driving around this borrowed vehicle from the, the dealership that's yeah, working yeah. on the van. And uh, tomorrow, she's uh, after it's done, she and another guy up in Portland are going to jump in our van and drive it a thousand miles to try to meet us on Tuesday morning so that we can start heading east and go back home. Wow. And then he's going to grab our van and take, and it, take back it back to Portland. And, oh, <laughs> so dude. He's going he's gonna to have about a 30, 35-hour drive uh, in front of him, and he's a good friend too. So yeah. um, we're blessed to have some really good, amazing people. And we're blessed to be on tour with Larry and his flask. It's yeah. an incredible band. Like They're so good and uh, good dudes. And um, But they've had their years of just fighting and, and being fighting to to make that impact as a band and, yeah. and make those fans and uh, make their statement of music music you know this is how we do music so yeah. it's been hard yeah it's been really difficult but at the same time there's been a lot of peace yeah I, I which i usually fret about a lot of stuff i struggle with that but just the kind of the peace that comes of just saying you know what's gonna work out yeah and, um you know i'm a christian so i believe god's faithful and He's shown that over and over and over again in this band. So I'm just like, I, I can't. I'm sick and tired of worrying. Yeah. I, I, I just need to go out and do and be faithful with what I know I'm supposed to be doing is playing music. So That's good, um, man. How has it been for you? Because the punk rock scene can can be, at times, a little less than welcoming, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, just a little bit. I'll be honest, man. Like I find that a lot of the older guys are, are way more chill about it than some of the younger ones are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's be honest. Like, there's a there's been a lot of bad experiences with uh, Christianity, with with people of religion when it comes to a lot of punk people, and we kind of approach it from that way. It's like, listen, if you, if you got a lot of people that are struggling with something because they've been hurt by it, like yeah. personally, oh yeah, you don't come in and just tell them why they're wrong. <laughs> right, that's not right. You know, like I I understand the hurt, I understand the frustration, I understand the anger towards the political side of the church, which I don't necessarily agree with uh, how political the church has become right. in a lot of countries and in America. I mean, you go to Germany and they got a long history of right. the church completely abusing uh, politics and it just sucks. It's like, it makes me mad because as a follower of Jesus and a, right. and a passionate follower of him, um, he's what I'm about. I'm not about all these other denominations and stuff. I mean, they're the family of God and I love them because I'm I, I'm called to love everybody, but... Um, I mean, it's it's hard when you have an experience with him. Yeah. Uh, what everybody else says is just kind of like, I'm sorry, dude. That's just not where I'm at. You know. Yeah. That being said, I do understand the pain. I do understand the hurt that people are at, and I and I respect that too. I yeah. I don't come in with a mentality. None of us do a mentality of, um, we're gonna come in and preach it to you, everybody. I I don't like it when anarchist bands do that to me. Right. I don't like that. You know, when anybody does that to me. Oh yeah. Uh, if you're if you're a vegan or vegetarian about what you eat, you know, or meat eater or whatever. Yeah. I don't like being preached at either. So why would I go and do that? That being the case, um, to be authentic, uh, an authentic songwriter. Right. Well, your faith is gonna play a big part in what you what you write about. Um, so as a, as a band that plays punk rock, it's the scene that we grew up in. It's the people that we are around. It's the people that we love in Chicago. Um, we've had to fight a lot just to be heard. I think there's a lot of, yeah. there's not a lot of people that are like, we hate you, but there's a lot of just kind of like, yeah, you guys are cool guys, and but mm-hmm. there's not a lot of like, but we're not really going to help you out because mm. you're a risk. And, and I think it, 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 for a lot of people, I think well, it just stinks that, I can't really get behind you 100% because it might impact my business as, yeah. a, as a band. And I get that. Um, yeah, I totally. But at the same time, authenticity is too important to give up for the, for, for business. Because after all, what is punk? Punk right. is to go against everything that you don't believe in is to, is to be countercultural. And even if it's – even if the punk culture doesn't like what you are, to give that up is not – punk rock is it right yeah so um i guess it's just one of those things where i just like you know what if you feel like that i respect that that's totally cool um but we've had people try to kick us off festivals we've had wow i've had uh, we've been threatened by people uh saying hey we're gonna come and slit your throats at this show Uh, we've had anarchist groups uh in europe misunderstand us and say we're gonna picket your show no one's gonna be able to go in 
all of them turned out to be really awesome experiences, actually, because we actually sat down with every single one of these people, or at least the last two, the, the cutting of our throats and the, <laughs> and the anarchist group. And we sat down with them, and we're all friends with them now, because wow. we actually just talked to them, and we just said, hey, we, yeah. you know, this is where we really stand. This is why we stand where we stand uh, yep. with certain things. If you have any questions, feel free to talk. I'm down with dialogue. Um, but that being the case, uh, as you get older... You know, and you're actively seeing people that have put their neck on the line for you. Bands like the Street Dogs, they took us out a bunch of times. And those guys, like, I mean, they had a, they had a guy in the band that was a professing Satanist at one time. Um, and another guy who was, a, who was a hardcore Catholic. And they were just like, they would always have this inner struggle of, like, between the two, like... You know, one put, would put his satan, satanic Bible on the on the dash, and the other one would be like, "You're gonna get us in a crash." You know, it was like yeah. taboo, and the other oh, guy yeah. would put his rosary out there. And wow, um, but they were always all of them were always very like, "We know you guys. We 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 love your music, and we really, even though we don't believe what you believe, we definitely uh, respect you as people." And we've had a lot of guys, older guys in the scene, guys that are really respected, guys that are really. Um, that I love that are just like, you know what? I'm too old to be dealing mm-hmm. with all this. Uh, is it appropriate? They're past, they're past wanting to prove themselves to anybody. Yeah. And they're just like, I just appreciate good people and you guys are good people. And, um, you know, thanks for being authentic. And, that, and we've yeah. heard that more than we've heard the negative stuff. So um, it's amazing how, how you can be so in disagreement with someone or, or just not understand them. Yeah. And then have a conversation with them and hear about their story. And go, <coughs> oh, yeah. I, okay, that not, that may not be my perspective, yeah. but I totally see. You know, I yeah. I was a I was a youth pastor for years and years. Oh, hmm. um, and now I'm a magician. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, but, there's some there's some magic I've yeah. seen youth pastors pull before. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So um, keeping your youth group funded, you know, half the time. Oh, was, serious, yeah. man. <laughs> But yeah, so my, I mean, I totally get, we, we had a very uh, unhealthy transition out, mm-hmm. uh, just wasn't a good situation. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. Man. No, no, I thank you for that. Um, but it's, it's so interesting because I've seen both sides of what you're saying. Like I've yeah. seen the side of, I was the guy who wouldn't talk to people who had different viewpoints mm. when I was, when I was a youth pastor, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'd pray for him or, you know, I'd mm-hmm. say, I'm going to pray for you, but I wouldn't sit down and have, have a conversation or a drink with someone yeah. and be like, Hey, what's going on in your life? Sure. And now on the other end, it's interesting how, um, I mean, kind of like you're saying, like my goal isn't to go out and preach to everybody, yeah. but just being who you are and, and loving people. Yeah. It, it's, it's been cool to see other people be like, Oh, okay. I can see how, yeah. You know, not everyone who believes this is crazy like I thought they were. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and it's funny, like, everybody wants the church to be that. They want people to go out and not be judgmental and not be this and not be that. Yeah. But when they run into a Christian, and like a group of us that are out there just like, hey, we're here. Talk to us. Let's just, let's have, I mean, you don't have to believe what I believe. That's fine. Right. And I'm not sitting here judging anybody, honestly. Like, um, I'm just here to love you and, and, and get to know you because that's... That's the heart God's given me, and He's given me so much grace in my life yeah. that I, I, for me not to offer to anybody else would be absurd. Um, but it's funny how there's a double standard with that. It's like you, you, you guys don't come out. You guys don't. You guys judge. All you do is judge. You don't get to know anybody. And then when somebody does come out, they're like, "Well, you're Christians. We don't want to deal with you." And it's like, <laughs> okay, that yeah. that's really. But again, it goes back to there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain Liar, that have been caused by Christians. And yeah. and honestly, like I'm a pastor's kid. Yeah. If there's any group of people that have been trashed by Christians, like look at a pastor and his family. Like yeah. you get you get you deal with everybody's junk and then they turn around and blame you for, yeah. for oh, their yeah. junk. And it's like, but that's what God's called you to do, and you do it because you know it. If you didn't do it, you wouldn't be being true to who God's made you to be. Yeah. And so um, you say, you know what, God, you're faithful. You have a purpose for this. You have a plan for this, and you're going to provide for it. Um, and so I humbly say, you know what, here, here I am. Use me. And so, um, and the same thing goes for anybody. Like, mm. if you're a if you're a tax accountant and you feel strongly about tax accounting, yeah, I don't know why anybody would, but there are people <laughs> out there. Um, God's probably given you that gift to be that. 
Yeah. Be it with a hundred percent of who you are and love people in the process. And like, there's nothing more special about a pastor or a yeah. missionary than there is about a person who's passionate about grocery store clerking. Like, yep. you know, it's just, just be who God's created you to be and love, love life, love, enjoy it. Yeah. But enjoy it with him and with his thoughts in mind, you know? So that's rad, man. Yeah. I love that. Cause I've, I've been on that side now trying to figure out disagreeing with a lot of how I was experiencing the church to be. Mm-hmm. And, and yet going, but I still love Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Sure, sure. And I and I still love people. Mm-hmm. And how do I how do I do that? So well, I mean, people who the, listen to this podcast know that even though this is not the topic of this podcast, yeah. it comes up. <laughs> sure, sure. Because <laughs> I'm in process. <laughs> well, you, you know what's you know what's encouraging is that your issues with the church uh, were not foreign to Jesus. He had issues yeah. with the church of his day, you know, right. the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Like, he had issues with the organized religion side of it. Uh, that being the case, like, we used to have a pretty thriving Christian punk scene. Uh, there was a small support scene for it. Yeah, everybody's dissipated and gone, pretty much, like, except for maybe two bands. There's a few. There's a few here and there, but when it comes to like hardcore touring bands, most of them have have gone on to other things, and we're sitting here left with like a few others. Um, and we call each other every once in a while, but there's just not cornerstone. There'd be like 20, 20 oh, yeah. bands, you know, oh, that yeah. would all get together. We'd have prayer. We get together and pray good bands, like t- solid, solid guys, solid music. It was just good. And so we find ourselves in this position of like, after I actually became a pastor for a short period of time, I was pastoring in a church in Chicago, my dad's church. He, yeah. he retired and I was there with another leader and we ran everything and, um, Small church, it wasn't a mega church, you know, but yeah. it became very easy for the Christian punk scene to bash church in general. And it's like, hey, listen, man, I don't care how much you may dislike, uh, I might dislike your wife, but the reality is, is that that's your wife and that's a sacred bond that you have with her. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't appreciate me coming in as an outsider and talking trash about her. Uh, even though she may be a jacked up human being, yeah, uh, you would like it. The same way it goes for Christ, like mm. for God. He's like, for some reason, he loves this thing we call the church. Mm. Um, not necessarily the buildings, not necessarily the organized religious aspects of it, but the flawed individuals that have the guts enough to say, I'm flawed and I need help and I want to I wanna reconcile my spirit to the Savior that, mm. that I have seen change my life. Um, it's a gathering of, of truly jacked up people and the saddest part is when that truly jacked up people start to see themselves as higher than everybody else i think that's that's the thing that really is off yeah um but it is a place where authentically it's like you know god my only chance is through your redemption here and i need to accept that um that's where i find myself is like so whenever the the other the other punk bands would started getting into this bashing thing i was always like God has some pretty strong things to say about people that mess with his his bride, mm-hmm. the one that he calls beautiful, despite all of her pimples and flaws and nastiness. Yeah, um, it's like, why do you love her? Like, why, Lord, do you love this? And um, I think his response is, it's because I love all of you, mm-hmm. and you need to know how much my how far my love goes. And that that's a that's a thing I've seen more and more as I get older. Grace wasn't as much in my life when I was younger, but as I got older, I'm realizing, man, I I need so much more of it. So I used to be really religious and and a lot of that got beat out of me through life. You know, there's some, some stuff happened that just, just destroyed my whole thought of how it should work and how, you know, how perfect it was supposed to be as a Christian. You're supposed to, it's supposed to be like this, you know, (laughs) and, uh, it's just not how it works. So. You talked about some of the older guys. It seems like the older guys in the punk scene, yeah, in the punk scene are like coming back to what it was really about in the first place. Yeah, none of us start in in music or art or entertainment because we think we're gonna make money and yeah. we're gonna be famous, and yeah. we do it out of love and out of a passion, you know, mm-hmm. and and then and then you transition into the season of like. Okay, but I either need to make money at it or I got to do something else. My kids can't eat passion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like and you can't, <laughs> it's one of those things like you can you can you can you can desire to eat passionately, 
but you can't you can't eat that passion. Is you know, the quote it's, of the it's one of those things. You know, <laughs> I, I don't even I don't have kids, but like it's one of those things. Like yeah, um, and you know what? It's true. Like as a musician, you have to really just say, and I'm sure as a as a as a magician, like you are too. <laughs> You have to form your life around that passion and desire and suffer losing the American ideal of what life should look like financially. Um, you choose a different way. Yeah. And in turn, your joy is higher. Yeah. Your peace is higher. You're not worrying. About, you're not You're not sitting there going, I am making the dreams of somebody else a reality. Dude, that's huge. You know, like... I know I'm chasing what, what I've been given to do. And honestly, I think, you know, as a, um, maybe it's, maybe it's archaic, but as a person who believes that God created me with a purpose yeah, and he, he created me, um, with a design, <laughs> like every person has a God given talent and a desire for a reason. Hmm. And that reason, if used and chased after can be brought to a place that will help the rest of humanity. Like, mm. and if you used, you know what I mean? I'm sure, I'm sure people have been blessed and encouraged by you being a magician. Um, but that's, that's the reason. Like if, if that's what you're passionate about, if that's what God has given you and you just come to life when you do that, yeah, uh, that's the heart of God. Cause he's watching his kid do what he designed him to do. And he's seeing him have joy in it and doing it with him. And I think that's the biggest key is like, it's not just wind them up and send them out and do what you want to do. Yeah. It's, hey, I want to be there with you as you do what I've designed you to do. Um, Dude, that's a beautiful perspective, man. It's from parents that were beautiful. Like, yeah. they, they raised us around music. And then when they saw, my dad hated punk. Yeah, he. We were playing it in church in the church sanctuary, practicing it. And he <laughs> and walked like, in. And is what like, is this? the church deacon board is gonna kick me out of being the pastor when they see what my kids are doing in the sanctuary. This is unholy. All this kind of stuff. And then he walked in one day, and I, I, he said, I looked at him, and I, and I said, Dad, what do you think? Pretty speedy, huh? And uh, he <laughs> said, at that point, God hit him and said, You can either get on what I'm doing with with these kids and encourage them in it, or you can get out of the way. Wow. Because this is what I want for these guys to be doing. And he's like, he, he cut him quick, and he was like, man, I'm on the wrong side of this. And, and he, he got behind us. I mean, some of our earliest tours when we were teenagers, like he would get behind the wheel of that van and drive. And, yeah. and take and the whole family's vacation would be spent around the tour dates that we had. And, and they were just like, you know what? If God's given you a passion, we want to get behind it, and we want to encourage you guys in it. And um, the scene in Chicago got to know him, the skinheads in Chicago, uh, got to know Pastor Dan. They love him. People still ask about him in places where we go. And they're like, how's Pops doing? And he's known as Pops. Wow. And he helped manage us for a little while. And then he passed us on to a really great manager in, in 05 and, or 06 or 07. But their, their, their thing was money's cool. It's necessary in life. And security's cool. It's necessary in life. Yeah. But we've been promised security through what Jesus told us. He said, look at the birds of the air, even they're clothed in their majesty, and they don't worry about where they're going to get their next meal. Mm. It just is it's provided for them. Be the same. And um, there's nothing in the Bible about a 401k. There's nothing in the Bible about all this kind of stuff. Because the church is really supposed to take care of each other, aren't we? Right. And, and, Which is contrary to where a lot of the focus is. Yeah. And you honestly, know, like, I'll be honest with you. Like, If somebody should be bitter, I'm watching my parents now in their 60s completely struggling and uh, you know when they had given their life to ministry yeah and there was our church didn't have enough to provide those things for them it was yeah. it was all ex gangbangers and prostitutes and people that had come from really bad scenarios who didn't have anything and that's who god called them to be for so and god's provided for them and that they know that so some people would call them stupid i think there's gonna be a lot of people i know that there's a lot of people whose lives have been completely changed by their heart and love for people so that's right i've seen yeah. it so but being a christian in the punk scene now that's that's a that's a bird with really messed up wings, a uh, really mm -hmm. strange looking thing to most people, and it's strange looking to me half the time, you know. Yeah. Like, because you guys wouldn't, I mean, <coughs> you probably would. Would you classify yourselves as a Christian band, or would you? Would it be more of like we're all Christians who make music together? I, I personally there, think that the term Christian music is absolutely. I think I think Jesus would hate it. Yeah. Because the reality is, is let's look at it this way. 
there is no other genre of music, and this is this is taken from somebody else, so I'm not making this up, but uh, there's no other genre of music that's classified by the content. It's always classified by the sound. So punk rock is fast, right? Yeah. Uh, Hip hop is, you know, the style. It's right. all style oriented. Right, right. Christian music is all content oriented with a massive huh. sound to it. I've never thought about that. Um, and what's funny is it's an industry. Yeah. So like when it, when the Christian labels put something out, guess who owns the Christian labels? Sony, B, Sony, yeah. BGMI, all these secular labels. They don't give a crap. No. They don't give a crap about anybody sounding outside of the box of what they think Christian music should be. Right. So I believe there should be, personally, I love it when I see Buddhist artists. Yeah. People that believe in Buddhism and they're being creative. I, I think that's okay. Yeah. Or, or a Muslim artist or whatever. Um, you know, I, I don't agree with their life philosophy, but I like seeing people be creative. I don't call them a, you know, yeah. oh, are you a part of the Muslim music industry? It's like, that doesn't <laughs> exist. Like, right? It's just, yeah. it's absurd. And in America, we've created this industry that Europe doesn't have, the rest right. of the world doesn't have. Yeah. Um, there's no industry for that anywhere else. Right. But, um, but for you guys, you're for there to be an issue in the punk scene, it's not like you guys are coming in. And and doing your set and then giving an altar call in a bar like no, no. like you're just happen to include your beliefs in some of your music yeah you know yeah and and that's what people have issue with no, um not necessarily I think um I think we're dangerous to a lot of people like hmm. people that have preached that religion is the problem of all of all of humanity. Um, it would look really weird for them to accept a Christian punk band, wouldn't it? Like, yeah, it's just it's one of those things where like, and I get it. I'm not, I don't blame them for that. At the same time, it's very, it's kind of like you always hated it when people judged you without knowing you. Hmm. That's that's the biggest problem the punk scene's always had is you look at me and you see my mohawk, you look at me and you see my ripped up jeans, you see my patches, and you judge me. Well, I'm gonna put this stuff on. I'm gonna wear this on the outside so that you will have to learn how to love somebody through all of the exterior stuff. Yeah. I mean, that was the original thing. Like it yeah. was, I want to be as abrasive visually to you as possible to see if you're worth hmm. my time of getting close to and knowing who I am beneath all the exterior. And what's funny is, is we've turned into the very thing that we, that the punk scene initially had an issue with wow. was judging people from the appearance without knowing their heart. Wow. Um, and because of that, we're dangerous. Mm. Um, we don't fit the club. That being said, there's a lot of bands and there's a lot of people that have totally reached out to us and loved us. So I'd, I'd venture to say more have done that than have ostracized us. So I don't, I don't want to make it seem like there's this big conspiracy. There are some major heavy hitters that don't that that will never let us on their festivals and will never accept us into their world um, because they've said that. There are a lot of people who are like, man, this is a good band. I really like this. A lot of older guys are like, I, I don't, I don't want my little kids listening to the bands I grew up on. But Flatfoot's cool, and it has mm. the same sound of a lot of those old ones. Oh, that's cool. Um, and that's kind of neat to see. Like, I, I love the fact that <laughs> we're safe for the whole family. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's not. You know, that's not the intention of us playing. But at the same time, like. It's just about being authentic and who you are, you know? That's awesome. And um, half the time, we're doing more ministry to each other on the road than we are, you know, yeah. to, to tons of people. And yet, I just talked to a guy the other day. He said, hey, man, I, I was an atheist. And I had this experience. I was listening to your record in my car. Yeah. And I said, God, if you're real, I'm singing these songs about you. Mm. Flatfoot's on the CD player. It's playing. I'm going to sing along these songs like I believe them. And I'm going to see what you do. And that's what he said. And he started singing along with the passion of somebody who believed the words. And he said at that point, he just told me this the other night, and I was like floored by this. I was like, this is nuts. He said, <laughs> he said at that point, he had an experience with God that he had never experienced in his entire life, and it changed everything about what he thought about God ever. And it was him alone, not in an altar call, not in a church. Right. It was him with a CD and a CD player in his car, and God came and spoke to him and gave him an experience with him that he cannot explain, and it's changed mm. his whole life. That, to me, is what it's all about. Like giving When people get an experience with God, I can't yeah. give you that. Yeah. I can yeah. just give you a testimony of what he's done in my life. And you weren't there, so you can either believe it or reject it. It's up to you. Yeah. But... I can't disagree with the things I've seen, you know, like, yeah. 
saw it. You didn't, I'm sorry, um, but you should just try to see if you can find it. Like, look for truth. Yeah. Just keep seeking. Like, I think the worst part is when we give up. Mm. And um, so anyway, Christ- be Christians playing music. Yeah. Um, I appreciate everybody who's being creative. Mm. I appreciate creativity because it makes everybody, ch- it challenges everybody. Yeah. Um, secular bands that don't believe in Jesus at all challenge me to be more creative because yeah. of their creativity. And I love that. What do you think is the biggest hindrance to creativity for young guys coming up? Any advice you would give to people who are entering the punk scene now and not in the early 90s? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopelessness. I think the biggest... The biggest hindrance to creativity is is that there is no hope for anything. Mm. Uh, Nihilistic ideas of just like, there is no hope, there's no purpose in any of this. And in order to be creative, you have to be a dreamer. You have to be able to believe that there is a dream. There there is a dream for something. Uh, You have to have a hope that there is something better. Mm. Uh, And you don't have to be a political band. You don't have to be, but just the hope that there is something better to be experienced than the things that have been so void of meaning yeah. in the past. And so I would say that's one of the biggest things. I would say, two, uh, just lethargic behavior. I mean, you got to practice. Yeah. Practice. Like, if you don't know how to work, don't become a musician because you got to have to work your butt off. Yeah. Probably work harder than anybody with a right. career job that will make three times as much as you will ever make. Yeah. But there's work in this and there's work involved, you know. It's not all just partying in the back room right. and, you know, doing hookers and blow, you know, it's, it's, yeah. that's not, you know, like, I mean, ne- it was never about that for us, but like, right. that's, that's what a lot of people think the dream is. And you do that for a week straight and see how long you last as a musician. You won't, you won't have a voice. You won't yeah. have any, you'll be sicker than a dog and you'll never, and we've done tours with bands that had that philosophy. And at the end of the week, they're just like, they, they break up because yeah. they, they just partied too hard and it wasn't about the craft or the art. It was about the party. Yeah. And, um, and then there's, and then there's people that are just enigmas that can do that and still create crazy music. And you're just like, I don't know about you, man. You're just crazy. <laughs> those are those are always the exception and never the rule. So there is a, this kind of resignation. It seems like right now with a <laughs> lot of people that I get a little concerned. Like it's one thing to go, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in the world, and to be discouraged by it. Mm-hmm. And I deal with discouragement. Yeah. But then I feel like. At times in history, because this is not the first time that things have been tumultuous in our history. <laughs> it's a great reason why you should study history. I, I, I'm a history teacher. Yeah. That's what I do for a living outside of music. Yeah. And I kind of laugh sometimes when I when I hear how worried people are now um, when it comes to how things have been in the past in the world. Yeah. And how past generations have dealt with, with the thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying like there, there have been other times too when people have, you know, I disagree with whatever's going on Mm -hmm. but they move into action and that's when some of the greatest art shows up that's when some of the greatest music is shown up yeah you know but i feel like right now it's there is somewhat of a shutting down well i guess this is just the way it is yeah Yeah. i mean i hear people say stuff like i don't want to bring a kid (laughs) into this world Hmm. and i'm like whoa sure sure. I, i mean i've got little kids and i think maybe that's why my perspective is different but i'm just I've never understood that attitude of like, well, I just can't bring a kid. I don't know. I sound, it's, it's, now it's, I sound negative. Well, no, no, that's no, no, I mean. no. But like going back to what I just said, uh, that's hopelessness. That's that's it's the fact that there is no hope. Yeah. And their hope has been sapped, and it's not their fault. Yeah. Um, it's just that they don't have any hope. Yeah. I mean, people are told constantly that they're a mistake. Yeah. And and when you tell society that they're a mistake, why would they want to have kids? Why would they want to? create create little beings that are full of joy uh that are full of innocence i mean there's a great movie called the other f word it's a it's the punk rock story of guys who grew up thinking they weren't going to make it past 30 and they have kids and how it changes their whole life huh um and it's got guys like um lars frederickson and it's got it's got uh, fat mike is in it like wow. all these punk rock dudes that are now having kids and they're just like Man, I, how'd this kid come out of me? You know what I mean? That's the response that a lot of these guys have, and it's it's kind of fun to watch because it's just like, man, like these guys didn't have any hope that they were going to make it past a certain age, and now they're they're the ones everyone looks up to, wow. and they're sitting here going, man, this this kid, this this is amazing. This is really special, and um, I actually have friends too in the same vein that 
are part of groups that believe it's wrong to reproduce. Hmm. And they'll actually shun friends that get pregnant wow. uh, because they believe so strongly that people shouldn't be having kids anymore because the overpopulation of the world and all that stuff. Um, yeah, man, I, I don't know. I don't know very many guys. And that's something that I, I conventionally say is like, I don't know very many guys in the punk scene that hate their kids. Hmm. I, I know a lot of amazing dads in the punk scene, like incredible guys that yeah. love their kids with every ounce of who they are. Because in a way, that kid was the thing that came along to give them hope. Yeah. It was God's grace in their life of saying, hey, I still see there's something worth redeeming in you. And I'm going to give you this gift of another of a little child to show you how much you're worth. To give you a chance to be for this kid what your parents were not for you. Uh, it's a second chance. It really is. Like, Dude, that's wild. So I was outside a fun house with my buddy Zach the other day. <laughs> mm-hmm. This guy who's part of his you know, punk rock gang that he's in mm-hmm. is coming up and he's talking about... I mean, he just had a kid like three months ago. And just totally a different being than he was before the kid. Yeah. And like, <laughs> you know, this guy who like would have been kind of a knucklehead to most people in you know, most people's perspective yeah and now all of a sudden he's like okay i think i can get my stuff together yeah. like i think i got a reason to change I, some things as a band we we started touring with a lot of old school punk bands a lot of a lot of guys that were really notorious yeah we kind of felt led to just be like you know what these guys we were warned about before we got on this tour to make sure that they uh we felt led to kind of approach them like they were like our favorite older uncles, yeah, and just honor them like with everything because they they're bands we looked up to in general. And when we did that, and we didn't hold their their reputations as scoundrels or fighters or womanizers or whatever they were yeah. to everybody else, when we saw them with the with the rose colored glasses that we decided to put on ourselves and say we're going to honor you, mm. and call out the gold that's there. Um, when we did that, we noticed that they would just blossom and become somebody that they were down deep, but nobody had ever given them a chance to. I mean, these are guys that were getting death threats at shows um, nightly, you know, and wow. saying, hey, I'm going to show up late to the show tonight. Don't worry about it. Somebody sent a death threat in. They said, we're going to kill us at the show tonight because I, a few years ago, I slept with their wife or, you know, it's the kind of thing. Yeah. And it was just, uh, but they were the coolest guys when you gave them the chance. Yeah. When you gave them a second chance and you didn't hold them to the the, the thing that the world had put upon them. Yeah. Their world had, had doomed them to be. Um, Again. It, all of us deserve that. I yeah. Think. Again, it goes back to conversation. Mm-hmm. To talking, not talking about people, but talking to them and sitting down with them and looking them in the face and yeah, and caring enough about the real story, not the one that. You know, we've just made assumptions of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true, man. <laughs> Anything we haven't talked about, man, that that you think uh um, we should hit on or that you want to share or? I think the part the the part about being a musician like the hardest part it for us is like when we come home from a tour that we've worked so hard on and then we have to make up financially for the time that we were gone. Yeah. I mean, we, we do well on, on the road. We do we do way better than I think probably about 70% of bands out there. Like, we do well comparatively. But we're not, you know, we're not selling out. There's always somebody bigger. Right. And we're also a young band in the in a very old scene. I mean, we, we opened for Cox Bar twice last December. And those guys have been playing for over 40 years. Yeah. Their youngest band member, the new guy in the band, has been there for 17 years. So, like... Wow. Uh, and that's a band I look up to so much. And they were great men. They're incredible guys that completely have encouraged us and, and spoken great things about us to other people. They put us in their book. We had played with them twice. We were this young Celtic punk band. They are just like, wow. we like these kids and we, we like what they do. Uh, and they asked for us to play with them you know, when they can. And it's just like, man, this is pretty powerful. But that's a band, too. They experienced a lot of rejection. They were said to be the next, you know... Um, clash yeah and uh, the label used them and abused them and threw them away and they put out some of the greatest music i've ever heard so um and they still in their 60s i think put on one of the best live shows i've ever seen like wow. they're incredible Dude. and you're just like man i respect this so much so but we all go home and when we're at home we work our butts off trying to produce for new records we work our butts off uh making sure merch orders are fulfilled and things are taken care of. 
um, doing interviews and that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, so it's a full time job, you know, it really is. And so it is a labor of love, like you said. What it's a passionate thing. You have to be yeah all about it. But um, I think a lot of bands, every band I know, some of the bands that most people love go home after they're done touring their families and they work other jobs because that's how they keep this thing balanced. We have a Papa John's manager in our band. We have a airplane baggage handler for Southwest Airlines as a bass player, my brother. Yeah. We have a T, uh, TGI Fridays waiter. Our bagpiper works for TGI Fridays as a waiter. He hates he hates the endless apps. So if you ever go into a <laughs> TGI Fridays... Do they do that? They, do, just... they just brought it back and the entire staff at his place was just frustrated because they... Um, they have to keep bringing at these appetizers to people that think they can sit there for six hours and just get no. free food for the whole time. And they can. Um, and they don't tip more because of it, even though they're holding one of your tables. Um, and then we have uh, we have a guy who does uh, uh, audio uh, audio for uh, conventions and, and gatherings for a sound company. He goes and does that. And I'm a, I'm a substitutes teacher in CPS high schools, and I have a yeah. teaching degree to teach high school history. So we work, we work really hard. <laughs> it's, yeah, you know. So, and then we have families too. So, but we love it. Yeah. It's so fun. <laughs> it it is, really man. is, man. Like it really. You know, I was talking to a comedian friend of mine, mm-hmm. and we were we both grew up doing music and playing in bands. And it's funny, like we we said, as fun as comedy is, as fun as doing magic shows is. There is nothing that we've ever done that's funner than playing live music. Because <laughs> you bring joy to people. I mean, yeah. I mean, as a comedian, you bring joy to people, but they can also hate you or you can yeah, offend them. Yeah, you bring it to some of the people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, magi- and magicians, I'm sure that's like, they're just trying to figure out what you're doing <laughs> yeah. and trying to be critical of it half the time. You know? Yeah, it's weird. It'd be like if you'd be playing a song and everyone in the audience is talking about the technique you're using and how did he, you know, it's yeah, interesting, yeah. that melody with those chord, that chord yeah, progression. Yeah. It, you know? Well, it sounds like a hipster crowd, you know? It's like <laughs> sitting there going, your harmonies are off, man. Yeah. Like, Are these hoodies uh, organic <laughs> cotton? cotton? Yeah, organic material. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to do this. My man. pleasure, man. Thanks for doing it. I appreciate how, it. How can people uh, follow you, get in touch with you, see what's going on with, with the band? Sure. Um, we have a website, flatfoot56.com. There's also our Facebook page, Instagram, Bandcamp. Uh, you can get us on iTunes, Spotify. It's everywhere. Just type in flatfoot56, and it'll come up uh, in most Google searches. Yeah. Yeah, we just, uh, we're excited about the album. We love it. We got a chance to work with a guy named Matt Allison in Atlas Studios in Chicago. He produced albums for bands like Alkaline Trio, Less Than Jake, Smoking Popes, um, uh, Lawrence Arms, a lot of really great bands. Uh, Rise Against, he did some stuff with them. So uh, really great guy. I think we definitely will, his studio will be our home studio for a while. That's so. rad, man. It's such a good album. It has been my travel companion since... Since it came out. Right on, man. Yeah. Thanks so much. Love it. I'll put a link on the show notes here so people just click on the... If you're listening to the podcast right now, just click on the logo, and then it'll turn to text, and there'll be a link there to go straight to iTunes and pick it up. So, Tobin, you rock, man. Thank you. Pleasure, buddy. Thanks so much. I'm going to turn this off. We can keep talking, but I'm going to turn this off. Because I may fall and I may fail a thousand times and in a thousand ways I may stumble from my path But like a thousand times before I'll get back up Drag myself from the floor Step out weary, step I'll make it through Hope you enjoyed this conversation with Tobin Ballwinkle of the band Flatfoot56. I would encourage you guys right now to jump over to iTunes. Click the link in the show notes to go to iTunes and purchase their new album, Odd Boat. It's absolutely incredible. And like I said in the show, it has been my travel companion and on repeat on my playlist for quite a while. Hey, while you're at iTunes, I encourage you to go subscribe, like, leave a five-star review of the show. And you don't want to miss all the great episodes we got coming out here on About to Break. Right